radio evolution. Radio evolution and Marco and all the volunteers for doing such a great job in organizing this and bring and being able to bring me here in Spain. So thank you you guys. Thank you everybody back there. Thank you. Doing an excellent job. So let's go back to our presentation. We're almost we're almost done with the math. <laughs> oh. Okay, so did you all uh, experience your vacuum self during the break? <laughs> Remember when you're, you're eating, you're actually putting vacuum in. <laughs> This, uh, I, I, in one way, I'm not kidding, because this might be, you know, there's, uh, there's Brahmins and masters that have now come forward that have not been eating for many, many years. And uh, when I was in the van, I barely ate for years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, uh, there might be ways that you can bypass the material world and get in and pull the energy directly out of the vacuum, out of the structure of space-time. This may explain why these people can do that. But um, let's get on with the, with the presentation. So now, after the scaling law, we see that, you know, the difference in mass uh, between a proton uh, the standard proton and the Schwarzschild proton is, um, is actually, you know, the result of the standard model omitting to add the force necessary to confine them. As well, you can think of it this way, uh, and that is that um, how is two protons that are mini black holes would interact with each other? So, you can calculate the force between the two protons, two little black hole protons. And that force uh, would be calculated this way in, in a classical way. Um, so force equals gravitational constants plus the mass square over the radius square. And so the, here is the gravitational constant, here's the mass of the Schwarzschild proton square, and here's the radius square. And the result is a force of 10 to the 47 dynes. It's very strong. Uh, and so in this case, gravity is the strongest force. It holds the atom together. Uh, and uh, when you've done this, then you can calculate how fast the two protons would rotate around each other. So their velocity, uh, or their, the first thing you have to calculate is their acceleration, how fast it would accelerate around each other. So uh, in high school, you probably learn F equals MA, right? Uh, so here is A is the acceleration equals F over M. So we just calculated the force. We calculated the mass. 
that will equal 10 to the 32 centimeters per second square. So now you have the two protons accelerating around each other very, very, very fast. From that acceleration, you can derive the velocity. So V velocity equals 2 multiplied by the square root of the acceleration multiplied by the radius. We calculate, and the result is 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. Anybody recognize that number? That's the speed of light. The velocity of light. Actually, you know, when you do the full calculation, you get exactly the speed of light, which is really remarkable because it's a fundamental constant and it just comes right out, you know, out of the calculation. The exact speed of light, right out of nowhere. And it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, you can now start to imagine, you can now start to realize that not only are you made of infinite little black holes, but these black holes inside of you are spinning at light, at the speed of light. It's very significant. You know, many masters have come and said, everything is light. Maybe that's what they meant. <laughs> everything is spinning at the speed of light. This actually may be why the speed of light is the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you can actually visualize that all of your atoms not only are little teeny black holes, but they're spinning extremely fast. You are a light body. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because, you know, many spiritual people have a tendency to think that in order to be spiritual, you have to escape the material world. And what I'm telling you today, what I'm showing you mathematically, is that the oneness, is that the infinite potential, is that the speed of light, the light body that you are, is not some esoteric thing, but is actually the material world that you're made of. That there is no separation between spirit and matter. It's all the same thing. It's a dynamic of the space itself. itself. It's a dynamic of the vacuum itself. You need not escape the material world. The material world is your gateway to infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> because that separation between spirit and matter has created a large fraction, a large chasm in our society. You know, there's the spiritual world that says we don't need matter. <laughs> right? I get phone calls from people saying, you know, we don't need no stinking technology. I'm like, but you're calling me on your cell phone driving your car. <laughs> and I have this spirit, the physicist saying, we, you know, I, I was in a physics conference and one group of physicists from England came and they were a little bit in shock when they came to this conference because it was a conference in California and instead of chairs, they had big, you know, exercise balls, you know. Because physics conference can be quite boring and so people fall asleep 
but when you were sitting on these balls, you could not fall asleep. <laughs> but you can imagine, you know, the physics community that came from England, you know, when they walked in the room and they saw all these like seven-year-old physicists bouncing on the balls. Oh, we're in California. <laughs> And uh, I was there, you know, a friend of mine was presenting about consciousness and physics, and, you know, one of them said, well, you know, our theory does not require consciousness. And I was like, do you realize you just insulted yourself? <laughs> Of course it requires consciousness. You wrote it. <laughs> you know. Right? So it's a problem because we've got some people that say we don't need consciousness, we don't need spirit, and the other people are saying we don't need matter. And guess what? It's all the same. It's all one. It's this fundamental field that produces a learning structure in space-time that makes up all of the material world, which is an expression of the structure of space-time itself, learning about itself. This is why matter evolves. It doesn't just sit there and do nothing. It actually evolves. It moves together. It tries and it organizes in many complex ways and produces amazing, amazing worlds. So it's not separated, and that has to go away. The monks in, that says we don't need the material world have to come and understand the material world is, is spirit, and the uh, physicists and scientists that say we don't need spirit have to realize that the material world is spirit. It comes together. What is spirit? Spirit is all of the information of all things present in everything. Right? Which I give you an equation to prove to you that it is so. So, the speed of light comes out. Remarkable. Think of yourself as this light body. You are a light body. Imagine, it's because... From the frame of reference of your size, it's your, your relationship to size that's confusing you. Because of the size we are, relative to the scale, we're sitting around going, you know, there's not much going on around here. Right? We're on a planet that's spinning that goes thousands of miles to, per hour through space that's going around the sun and it's going thousands of miles per second through space which is going around the galaxy which is, this thing we're hurling through space right now unbelievable dynamic is occurring right now and we don't see it because from our perspective it's like oh yeah the sun came up you know Oh, yeah. Kind of going slow, right? And then from this, our perspective, we see the atom. We say, oh, you know, there's not really much happening there. These things are black holes spinning at the speed of light. Super dynamic world that's embedding the structure of space-time. You know... We teach children that our planet is going around the sun like this, in a circle. That's not the case. We should never, ever, ever teach that to children. In my school, we had a sun. We had this little machine, this little device. We had the sun in the middle with the earth and the moon, and we had like a little thing we turned on the bottom, and it would go around like that to show us what the solar system looked like. Did you have that in your schools? This is completely wrong. 
That would be like saying to children that the earth is flat. It's not true. Why? Because our sun is moving through space at 3,000 miles per second. So as the planets are following the sun, they are making this huge spiral through space. And so after a year of the Earth spinning around the sun, we're not anywhere close to where we were a year ago. We're millions, billions of miles away. Every minute, every second our, is different from the other because the evolution of the coordinates of the space-time manifold is constantly changing. We're never coming back to the same point. The information is constantly changing. We are, through this speed of light interaction of app, you know, where the electron appears and disappears and appears and disappears, we are embedding information along that spiral on the structure of space-time. Along that path. Can you all visualize that? And so, that if you actually took the earth and you took you on the earth, your body on the earth, you could say that like we could follow that path through space and your DNA is actually embedding information on the structure of space-time all along that path. Do we have any evidence that DNA does that? Yes. It's called phantom DNA. It was discovered by the Russians. It was discovered by accident because there was a scientist that was doing a measurement in a spectrum analysis device scattering photons off, a surf of, off DNA and he was taking measurements and he went for lunch. He removed the DNA sample from the device and went for lunch. And when he came back from lunch, you know, I think Russian people like to drink vodka. <laughs> he forgot that he had removed the DNA strand, and so he, he continued his experiment. He continued to make measurements. And the measurements were coming out like the DNA was still in the machine. But the ma the strand was not there anymore. So, DNA leaves an imprint on the structure of space-time. Leaves an imprint of information on the structure of the vacuum. You are imprinting information on the structure of the vacuum. This is actually, according to me, why you have memory. Because, you know, if you had no memory, you wouldn't have time. Would not exist. Because you couldn't remember anything. <laughs> so, actually, Memory, which has not been identified in the brain, you know, people are trying to figure out where memory is in the brain. You know, a lot of scientists are trying to identify where is consciousness in the brain. I think Buckminster uh, uh, Fuller said it the best. He said, the problem with the current approach to science is that we have made, we have confused the telephone for the conversation. Right? The brain is a telephone. It is not the conversation. <laughs> the conversation is the structure of the vacuum interacting. The chemistry that occurs in the brain, the electrical discharge, is a result of the structure of space-time interacting, not the source. And that's why, if, you know, 
there is disturbance in our field, in our emotion, then chemistry starts to change in the brain. You can't just change the chemistry of the brain and assume that the problem, the emotional trauma and all this is going to go away because that's still embedded on the structure of space-time. So using this, I've helped people that had serious trauma try to help them relieve that trauma because somewhere it's on the structure of space-time. And so since that actually connects right up to you, in your back actually, right? Since that connects right up to you, then you can have access to that structure along that path. This is actually how psychology work, you know, people say, oh, you know, you think of your childhood and try to have a new optic on your childhood, and that will, you know, relieve you from trauma. Well, that's because, although they don't know that, that's because you're actually changing the memory imprint on the structure of space-time. You can actually follow the information of you along that structure all the way back to your mother. That spiral goes all the way back to your mother and that connects your spiral with her spiral. Where you come connect with your mother, you can you can you can go towards your father's spiral or you can go towards your mother's spiral. And then you can continue along that path. And then again and again, this is actually how, according to my work, genes gather, keep information continuous. You know, in current biology, there's no explanation how genes carry all this information that produce the genetic pool. The continuous from a family to another family, you know, along that path. This is because the imprint is actually in, uh, uh, informing the genome structure. So, along that path, you can actually go with your consciousness, and I've been able to help people do that, because if you actually understand the correct mechanics, of that path, you can follow it, and along it, you can change your relationship to an event. You can change the geometry. So if there was an event that was traumatic, you can actually uh, experience the event from a different angle. For instance, for canceling the event completely, if somebody did something wrong to you, you can experience the event from that perspective, from the person that did something to you. And there you're going to experience maybe their fear and their trauma and all this. And then that will cancel your experience. And all of a sudden, all of the information moving forward back to your present will change. And as a result... I've had people like have, you know, uh, healing almost instantaneously on the spot. Release like trauma that has been there for the whole life. And as you change this, it's going to change it forward to your present and that will change the information moving forward to your future because now it's changed. And from that moment, you can change that information all the way back as well, because when you change it, it's going back in that spiral. Now you're changing generation of information throughout time. Your mother, your grandmother, da 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 da. Your father, your grandfather, da da da. You see, because at you are that very tip of the spiral 
You know, that very tip at the end of that spiral that goes generations and generations and generations till the beginning of time. So your responsibility, you've accumulated all this information from all of these generations. It's your responsibility to make it different. So, all this from... I got a little sidetracked. Sorry. But things are, protons are spinning at the speed of light. So V equals C, the speed of light. Then from the speed of light, we can calculate the period. The period would be how long it takes for one proton to go around the other. Right? Like meaning in one turn. How long it takes for one turn to happen. So the period, or T, the time, will be 2 multiplied by pi multiplied by R. Right? Because it's one circle. So pi by R over the velocity. Because it's going that speed for one turn. And that will give you... 5.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 23 seconds, which just happens to be the exact characteristic um, interaction time of the strong force. See what just happened? This is a, this is a measured value that we've done that shows that, you know, that so-called strong force that they threw in, they, they calculated and then in laboratory they looked for how fast that strong force can attract another particle. So like if you throw a, an electron near a, pro, you know, a nuclei, how fast will it grab it? And that calculation is 10 to the minus 33. So that's in Classical quantum theory, meaning in, in the standard model. Except that here, I got the same answer, but completely classically, with a completely different approach. So I'm getting the right answer with a completely classical model. No quantum thingy. Right? It's remarkable. Now we calculate the frequency. So that means half, like if it's going around each, you know, it took, ten, it took 10 to the minus 33 seconds to go around one time, then how many times does it go around in one second, which is in hertz, right? So then that would be 1 over the time, and the result is 10 to the 22nd hertz, which is a typical measured value of the gamma ray emission frequency of the nuclei of an atom. So this is actually the decay of the atom. It comes right out from black hole protons spinning around each other. No quantum theory again. Very simple. You're getting the right answer with a very simple mechanical approach to the atomic world. And when I say simple, mechanical, no quantum theory, some people could get disappointed. They're like, well, I like quantum theory. Because a lot of people look at quantum theory as like, wow, this is a theory that actually has a possibility for it, esoteric understanding of Consciousness and all this, but I want to make clear that although this model is classical and mechanical, which is Einstein didn't believe in quantum theory. He thought there must be some classical mechanical way to describe the atom. It's not some really crazy esoteric object that you can't visualize and da 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 like in quantum theory. Um, Although it's treated classically, you're dealing with a mini black hole. 
which has infinite potential. You're dealing with a very, very amazing esoteric object that, uh, that has infinite connection to all the things in the universe. So it's not boring. Mechanical and classical is not boring. Mechanical is actually completely nonlinear. It's just that we've confused our little mechanics of our cars and our devices with the mechanics of the universe, which is quite different. Mechanics in the universe is quite different. Let me give you an example. Something that seems to be obvious, right? You're going to say, the mechanical function of my hand moving from here to there. Sounds pretty simple, right? Should be easy to measure, should be easy to calculate. My hand goes from A to B. I can calculate how fast it did that. Can you? Let's see. Okay. Well, it, if I close the system, which many of our laws of physics all start with this statement, within a closed system, right? And the laws of entropy, the laws of mechanics commonly start with this. Within a closed system. Then you look in a physics book, closed system. What's the definition? No such thing has ever been found. Oh. Okay. So now, in a closed system, I can calculate my hand when at like 0.1% of a, you know, of a mile per hour moving across from A to B. But if there's no such thing, if, there, if everything is embedded into larger and to larger and to larger and to larger and into smaller and into smaller and into smaller and into smaller, then it's different. If I try to calculate my hand going from A to B now, I have to say, well, while it was going from A to B, the earth spinned a little bit. So I have to add that because my hand is not isolated from the spin of the earth. It's not in a closed system. So I have to add that. Now my hand is already moving very fast. And then I got to say, oh, well, the earth is spinning around the sun. So I have to add that. And then I have to add the sun is spinning around the galaxy. Oh, my hand is going mile, you know, thousands of miles per second already. Right? And then my the galaxy is turning in a cluster, in a cluster, in a supercluster, in a supercluster, in a universe. And the universe most likely is spinning a larger one and a larger one and a larger one. Multiple. Oh, my hand is going at the speed of light. You see. Mechanical functions are not so boring. They're a little nonlinear. So how do I solve that? Does anything move? What is this? The only solution is to realize my hand is appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing in, con in sequence that are occurring so fast at the speed of light that it appears continuous. It's actually my hand is the vacuum, the whole universe, and then back to my hand, and then the vacuum, the whole universe, and back to my hand. And, and that's how the universe actually knows where my hand is. <laughs> so that it can coordinate everything else. You guys are following this? So, you know, my hand is actually being, it's just like a movie, right? You have a frame and then you have a space and you have a frame and you have a space. But when you run the movie fast enough, you don't see the spaces. You just see the movement continuous. 
Well, this is happening at the speed of light, so there's no way you're going to see the spaces. You might feel the spaces if you're really, really, really good at experiencing your vacuum self. And if you're really good at experiencing your vacuum self, that's because you spent a lot of time going towards that vacuum, like some masters might have been able to do. And all of a sudden, you get these masters that can appear here and disappear over there. You know, you could say, hey, when my hand disappeared here, I wanted to reappear over there without going in between. Now, if you succeed at doing that, don't forget to take your body with your hand. <laughs> because it could be very uncomfortable to have your hand over there and your body over there. But, you know, telekinesis, moving object at a distance, all these things start to make sense. And that's why I was saying mechanical function are very amazing, very esoteric, very remarkable. They imply infinities, not in your function, relationship between all things connected. So, I got sidetracked again. Now, there's another calculation we could do with this model. And that is to calculate the anomalous magnetic moment. The anomalous magnetic moment is called that way because in classical, in quantum theory, it's called anomalous because they don't say, they don't know where the magnetic moment of the atom came from. It's remarkable. You would think we know that. You know, ultimately that means, if you push it a little bit, ultimately that means that if you ask a physicist where does electricity come from, he can't really tell you. Because he will say it's a charged particle moving through a field, right? Producing an electric field. But if you say, where did the charge come from, the charge of the electron or the charge of the proton? Don't know. Don't know where it came from. So it's called anomalous. Well, what we did is we took a little proton and we did a really, really rough calculation. Okay, we're going to improve on that calculation. I was presenting this to a physicist the other day in Basque Country and she was saying, why did you do that calculation yet? I'm like, you know, I'm busy. I need help. Please help us. Um, we did... We took our little Schwarzschild proton and we said we put a little charge on it. And then we calculated how much magnetic field that would create. We took the measured charge, right? And we just stuck it on top of our proton. And so charge is going to equal, the, the magnetic moment is going to equal the charge multiplied by the radius multiplied by the velocity over 2. We plug all the numbers in, and the result is 3.17 multiplied by 10 to the minus 26 joule Tesla. The measured value in laboratory is 1.4 multiplied by 10 to the minus 26 joule Tesla. Very close, considering this charge here should be around the whole proton, not just on the point. So we get the right answer for the charge of the atom. Now we can explain that charge comes from the vacuum interacting, producing boundary condition of the black hole atom. And that, and, and that charge 
is coming from this interaction. So this is very significant because all of a sudden we can extrapolate charge directly out of the vacuum. It's the vacuum that produces charge. Well, charge and spin, right? The two combined, producing the magnetic moment. Does anybody see a possibility here? All of a sudden, we have found the source of charge. And the source seems to be an energy density of 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube. Meanwhile, on little planet Earth over here, people are walking around going, dude, there's not enough energy for everybody. We got to fight for it. We got a war. I need that energy. Meanwhile, Every single atom in the universe is extracting it directly from the vacuum using spin. This is a possibility for humanity right here to start to understand how to extract energy directly out of the source of energy that produces all of the universe. Thank you. Thank you. And remember the numbers? 10 to the minus 39% of the energy in a centimeter cube of, uh, uh, in a proton volume is the only thing that's needed to produce all the proton. So imagine if we extract a little teeny weeny beady little teeny thing of the amount of energy that's there in technological ways, we can power the whole planet for thousands and thousands of years. Right? And we could extract that energy and we can extract that energy anywhere in space. Anywhere in the universe, we will have access to infinite amount of energy. Can you imagine a society that reached that level? What it looks like? Do you think they are going to war with each other to get some oil? Most likely not. Do you think they go to war each, with each other to try to get more land? Most likely not. Why? Because if you have this level of energy, you can curve space-time. You can produce wormholes. You can make black holes in laboratory. You have space drives instantaneously. We are very, very close to this moment. You would be surprised what goes on in laboratories around the world. There is a possibility there that will change our world. We have reached that level, that level in which a society must come off the surface of their planet. Why? Planets are not a good place to hang around for too long. They're not stable. Cosmologically speaking, you've got a pretty short amount of time to get your you-know-what together and get off. 
right? I'm not the only one saying that anymore, you know. Now, this is the second time it's mentioned, it makes the news every time. Stephen Hawking has been saying, we have to get off the surface. The first time he mentioned this a few years ago in Japan, he got in a lot of trouble for saying that. And then he did it again a few months ago. It's crucial. Any society that reaches higher levels of consciousness must as well reach higher level of technology that matches that consciousness. Any society that reaches higher levels of evolution must learn to live free, unattached to a surface in the universe. Because planet change and very little change makes big difference for little humans on it. You know, it's remarkable that we're still here. People don't realize, again, it's a thing of scale. The earth is like a little grain of sand beside the sun. A little teeny weeny thing. And the sun has sun flares. It blows sun flares all the time. And it goes through periods of time where it blows really big sun flares. And the earth atmosphere is like if you took a billiard ball and you painted a little shellac on it. You know, you just paint it like you paint on your deck, right? That's actually the thickness of our atmosphere. Okay? One sun flare, that's a good one, in the right direction, and the Earth atmosphere just goes, sit. In the solar system, the rest of the planets probably wouldn't even notice. They go, sit. They go, oh, what was that? Oh, that was the Earth atmosphere just went. Oh, okay. Humans down here, though, oh, run out of air instantaneously, right? Done. All of a sudden, this planet looks like Mars. It's actually remarkable that that hasn't happened yet. The probabilities are very high. Never mind all the meteorites and the comets and all the stuff that's being thrown at the Earth that we keep missing. There's a program that was done by an astronomer where the Earth is turning around the Sun in the wrong model, you know, because it should be a spiral. But uh, there's a little line, a white line that appears for every meteorite that missed the Earth, right? That's big enough to like create like large cataclysm. And you, after a few years of the Earth going around the Sun, the, the screen is full of white line, full. It's constantly missing us. <laughs> we live in grace. We do. But I don't think we should push it. I think we're close to this moment where our society has reached levels where we have exhausted a lot of our resources and we have to come to the next level. And in order to come to that next level, the only thing we must actually understand and apply is how gravitational field and the structure of the vacuum, the energy at the source of creation, works. As soon as we understand that, we're done. No more struggle. No more lack. You know, the only reason we war 
is because we have a lack mentality. That's it. That means we think there's limited amount of resources and we got a war for them. So this is on its way. The only problem, the only hick, is will we, as a morphogenic field, be able to actually make that transition? It's a very, very difficult transition. Now what I'm talking about might sound to you like completely outrageous. You know, it sounds like, is he talking about the Jetsons? Do you guys have the Jetsons? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's hard to visualize flying saucers and things, right? But imagine that you were a person that lived on that lake near where the Wright brothers flew the first plane. And you went to that person, like a person came to you, uh, you know, two weeks before the Wright brothers flew the first plane and told you, in two weeks, these people are going to come here and they're going to take an object that weighs thousands of pounds and they're going to fly it through the air just by pushing the air around it. You would have said, no way. No way. And in fact, all of the physics community of the time all said, no way. There's all sorts of articles you can get from that time of very prominent physicists all around the world saying, there's no way you can do that. And for almost five years, the physics community around the world said that the Wright brothers' flying plane was a hoax. Because all calculations show that you could not do that. It sounded like exactly what I'm talking to you about at the time. It sounded like free energy. The idea that a system can produce enough power in the wind around it to lift its own weight sounded completely outside of the physics possible. They didn't notice that birds were flying over their head. Many physicists don't come out of their little room, you know, in the universe. So, this is where we're at. We're very, very close. And this started to give us the understanding on how the universe produced charge, how the universe produced electricity, and it produced a lot of it. A lot. So, it's very important. If we wanted to understand what are the structures that produce such an effect? If we wanted to actually in start engineering a device that made that power, that could tap into that vacuum, we would have to understand exactly how the vacuum structure produces that charge. Now we know that most likely from these equations, the vacuum structure does produce it. So how does it though? Well, early on, you see, most people don't know, but I did most of this research, some 25 years of research, because there is important technological discoveries to be made. Most people don't know. I'm very interested in hardware, in technology. Because I do a lot of philosophy and a lot of theoretical physics. They think, 
I don't do that part. But now I'm starting to be more vocal about it. I've done some 11 years of work in laboratory. I, uh, I do a lot of engineering. And um, in order to understand how to build such a device, I had to understand how, what are the fundamental mechanics that allows the structure of the vacuum to produce a singularity, to produce a point of infinite density. Because if I understood these dynamics, then I could reproduce it in a laboratory. So I start to, I, I realize that when we look at black holes, which is with Einstein field equation, there was something strange. That is, the way we were treating spin, rotation, was not quite right. I realized that what we had done is we had attached the frame of reference to the rotation of the black hole, the rotating metric. What does that mean? The reason why we did this is because when they try to calculate the dynamics of a spinning black holes with Einstein's equation, they realize that mechanical spin is extremely complicated. It has Coriolis effect, and it has, you know, this, there is a, a gyroscopic effect and all this, and they want it to eliminate the complexity. When we do that, Typically, we miss something very important. So how did they do that? They said, hey, we're going to eliminate gyroscopic effects by attaching the frame of reference to the rotating metric. So what does that mean? Imagine you have a V8 motor here, okay, a large engine. And there's a shaft coming out of the engine. And the shaft is spinning at... 5,000 RPM, and you're standing in front of that shaft, and in a great moment of stupidity, you decide to grab onto it. Too much testosterone or something. You will experience gyroscopic effects. You will experience the effects of spin. One of them is going to be your shearing. Shearing will be your skin flying away from you at high velocity. You will experience thermodynamic effect. That would be the smoke coming off your hands. You will experience those things. However, if I grabbed your frame of reference, if I grabbed you at the exact same time as you grabbed onto the shaft and spun you at the same rate, you wouldn't experience any of that, right? But I could still say I'm accounting for spin because I can count how many times you went around. This is what they did. So what I said is that's not appropriate. We have to stabilize the frame of reference in the structure of the vacuum, meaning the vacuum is the frame of reference. And then the solution to Einstein field equation is different. So this is another paper I published with Dr. Rauscher. She helped me a lot with the, the math in there because those are much more complicated math which I'm not going to go through with you today. <laughs> so don't panic. But um, Dr. Rauscher and I wrote the math for this. It's the first paper I published. Uh, it's called The Origin of Spill, Spin. And uh, it adds torque and coriolis effect to space-time. It says, Einstein said that space-time curves to produce gravity. This new equation says when it curves, it curls, like water going down the drain, and it produces spin. 
And so when we did that, then the solution, instead of a black hole looking like a sphere, it looks like a double torus. A torus is like a donut. You guys have donuts? Yeah, good. Woo. <laughs> Um, and uh, if you have two donuts spinning in opposite direction, now you have a double torus. And why is there two spinning in opposite direction? Because this Coriolis effect, one in one direction, the other one in the other. Like this hurricane and typhoons, right? In the northern hemisphere, they're spinning in one direction, typhoons are spinning in the other. And so the, now you have this toroidal field instead of this idea that the surface of systems are spherical, they're actually toroidal. And because they're toroidal, now you have a function, now you have the mechanics of feedback. It's expanding and contracting at the same time. Right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The universe is expanding and contracting at the same time. Actually, last month was very exciting for me because they, they found that when they look in one direction, it seems to be contracting, and when they look in the other direction, it seems to be expanding. New data came out. So now they're starting to realize, wait, it's happening at the same time. It's not like the universe expands and then contracts. It's happening at the same time. And this is why you have a feedback of information. You can think of this as your light body. You know, with this point in the middle being your heart chakra. And actually, I teach a meditation based on that. And maybe the next time I come to Spain, I can do a weekend, a weekend workshop, which I call the Delegate Program, where I can teach this meditation. <laughs> and that, then you can see that like, it comes out of the equator, comes back up to the poles, come out, and every time it comes around, you see what's in the middle of the donut. Space. Right? The vacuum. So, um, where the, where, you see, if this is the, solu the new solution to black holes, where the point of infinite density is, is space is the vacuum. The vacuum is the infinite density. You all follow this? This is why the vacuum is connecting all the points, is because it can go to the middle. So it's always connected, it's never separated. You are the center of one of those double torus. You can uh, even think of it with like a hole here and a hole here, you know. You get the idea. You can look at it as like the two hemisphere of your brain, you know, with your ears. You put that on the side. Right? So, we are at that point where we find that this interaction here, you see, in order it comes out, the information goes back in, it informs the vacuum in the center, comes back out, goes back in, informs the vacuum in the center. You can think of these as the electron and the positron. It's like every little teeny atoms you're made of is like this. And Interestingly, when you look at it from the top, it looks like the each in. 
an uh, ancient symbol. And, uh, you know, actually, I, um, I did, a, I have a brand new animation. I did an animation of the I Ching. Uh, actually, not the I Ching, I'm sorry. The yin yang. Sorry. I got a little lost. Um, and let me, let me just pull that out real quick. You guys don't mind? Okay, uh, I just want to show you quickly. Um, let's see. Let's see. So, let me bring it out. Can you all see that? This has been done just recently. Some of the first times I show it in public. It was in my brain for almost 25 years. I finally got it done. I was trying to solve at the time, how does the black dot end up in the middle of the white? And how does the white dot end up in the middle of the black? And I realized... Thank you. I finally got it out of my brain. And, um, you know, I thought it worked when I was working it out in my brain, but it was good to see it actually done. And you can see that this is the only way you can solve for no discontinuity. Because the philosophy of the Yi Chin and the Yin Yang is that they cannot be discontinuity. So, this is the only way to solve it. I'm glad to be able to show it. So, we have to go for lunch. So, thank you so much. <laughs> After lunch, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And after lunch, we're going to talk a little bit about ancient civilization. So have a wonderful vacuum lunch.